Hello book people, I hope everyone is well and enjoying their videos today. I am Jasmine aka Fiction is Vice. Today I'm sharing my love on Margot Lanigan's Black Juice. But first let me read the blurb and tell you about the author. 10 outstanding stories that delight, shock, intrigue, amuse and move the reader to tears with their dazzling imaginative reach, their dark humour, their subtlety, their humanity, and depth of feeling. Black Juice is a book of breathtaking stories that defy boundaries. They are dazzling, ruthless, tender, fierce, unique. Ten deeply moving stories from an exceptional author. Margot Lanigan is an internationally acclaimed writer of novels and short stories. Her collections of short stories have garnered many awards, nominations, and short listings. Black Juice was a Michael L. Prince on a book, won two World Fantasy Awards and the Victorian Premieres Award for Young Adult Fiction. I love spoiling things, so this is your official spoiler warning. I thought I might do a quick rundown on each of the 10 stories before I talk about two of my personal favourites. This book is a roller coaster. Each unique story had its own unique emotional hook. This collection is weird fiction, but the central core is an emotion we would all readily identify with, like grief, hope, or a bit of fear for the unknown. It's an identifiable emotion, even if we don't immediately recognize the world that each protagonist is in. The first story in the collection is Singing My Sister Down, which is Margot Lanigan's most anthologized short story. Singing My Sister Down is about our protagonist watching his sister's slow death. The sister's death is a punishment for a serious crime and she is sinking very, very slowly in a tar pit. There is a whole ceremony involved in this death sentence. Uh, while the protagonist and the family are on the tar pit right with their sister and daughter, the whole community sits on the edge of the tar pit and has turned out to watch. The second story is My Lord's Man, which follows a medieval serf, I believe, who follows his lord who is following his lady who has run away from the castle to a gypsy camp for a bonfire night. The third story is Red Nose Day. Uh, Red Nose Day is a charity drive in the UK, US and here in Australia but Margot Lanigan has overturned our expectations on this one. This is one of my favourites and I'd love to talk about it some more after my summary. Then we move on to Sweet Pipit, in which a herd of elephants are on a mission to rescue the kindest caretaker they've ever known. This story has some of the hardest names to pronounce in the entire collection, but has the sweetest ending, I think, for all of the stories. Then there is my personal favourite and is the longest of the short stories in the collection uh, called The House of the Many. The house refers to the musical instrument, the accordion, and Margot Lanigan has layered descriptions of the accordion's music with everyday life and religion. It's another story I want to discuss after the summary. Then we learn about The Wooden Bride, the story of a girl who is undertaking a rite of passage to become a bride at the cost of becoming a wooden-like person. The protagonist's status as a bride is very important to her and to her community, and it's like she has been married to that community, uh, to the city, to the church, and to the country as a whole. Then we have the short story, Earthly Uses. Uh, in my humble opinion, this is the most interesting, but I consider it the weakest link in the collection. 
in earthly uses it's uh, about a boy who's tasked with summoning an angel to help his dying nan but these angels are red-skinned leathery iron-tipped wings and have bright but dark eyes and they're an interesting integral part of the world in the story the story Perpetual Light made me laugh out loud, uh, not because it was deliberately funny, but because I could relate to the family dynamics at play here as our protagonist meets up with her family for a funeral. Perpetual Light is the most recognizably Australian story. The twist is there's been an environmental collapse and there's a wordplay on the perpetual light of a good soul against the hellish perpetual light uh, that is part of the protagonist's everyday life. Then we have an original story, uh, Yal Inan. Uh, Yal Inan is about a young orphan who has an unrequited love for a lucky boy. The title Yal Inan Yolinen is the name of the monsters the protagonist is quite familiar with and tries to warn the community about. And the last story, Rite of Spring, is a short story on a ritual this community performs by sending someone out to the top of a mountain uh, during a raging storm to perform a speaking of words to bring on the first day of spring. And this story focuses on a protagonist who isn't automatically comfortable with his words. It was Red Nose Day and the House of the Manny where I felt the book was hard to put down, but uh, it was earthly uses. I felt I had to slog through it. But don't get me wrong, all of the stories were interesting and enjoyable in their own way. And this book is highly recommended. But Jelly had class and all the allergies that came with that. For anyone who might not know, there is a charity drive in the UK, US and Australia called Red Nose Day. It's to raise funds for children in poverty. You buy yourself a red nose like the clowns wear or you can buy a badge if you're too embarrassed to wear the nose. The everyday world in this story is everyone is a clown. Celebrities are the greatest clowns that ever lived. The everyman are the theater riggers and the street sweepers that pick up after the clowns. So anyone who stops performing or chooses not to perform at all are considered the strange people. Our nameless protagonist has never performed and he has a rifle. We were up high in the nun's palace. No one had slept here since the old girls got torched for wowserism, so it was a good hide. Our nameless protagonist is a sniper who is assassinating the more prominent citizen clowns. He's a random spree shooter. And he's doing this because he is avenging the abuse of children. Our nameless protagonist is partnered with a man named Jelly. There's a moment in the story where these two guys find out they had killed Jelly's brothers. Jelly hadn't recognized them in the moment, but when he realizes the consequences of what he's done, there is this really interesting description where Jelly decides to put on his clown makeup and costume and perform some of his routines to no one but our nameless protagonist who true to his mission, kills Jelly. I love the details on the rifle our nameless protagonist uses in this story. Uh, please excuse my Italian. I don't speak it as fluently as bad French, but the rifle is a fiore sketchare. It's two Italian words put together. Fiore is flower and sketchare is to crush. So clowns are assassinated with a flower crusher, sort of. A top of the line Fiore, famous for her precision work during the Lemonade Wars. She was matte black with her slender, high haunched build of all the weapons Benato designed for Fiore. 
and totally focused on the job. No engraving, no mirror plating, no fussy walnut work. The only mark on her was the serial number stamped into her barrel. Because this is a world where clowns and performers are celebrities, it stands to reason these are the people with the most power and therefore they're also the abusers of power. Our nameless protagonist hints at the abuse of children in state-run homes. Our nameless protagonist grew up in these homes, though he claims he didn't get the worst of it, though apparently it's enough to make him want to kill them all indiscriminately. If it's got a red nose, never tell it your true name, said Frick Knuckles before he went off to the tram station to lay his head on the rail. Call yourself Billy or Tommy or anything that's not your name. That way it can be happening to that other kid and you can keep your own name for yourself. Raw earth, dead fire, unclean flesh. All these underlay the worst smell. I found it hard to grasp House of the Many in one reading. The language is so layered. I found it a bit difficult to pick out quotes to share because these layers are in whole paragraphs that make up whole pages and I wouldn't want to overload anyone or infringe Margot Lanigan's copyright. Part of the reason why this is one of my favorites is because I had to read it more than once to, and, uh, to understand everything. If you do pick up Black Juice, which I highly recommend that you do, you'll need to be prepared to read a few stories more than once to get the whole story. We're introduced to our protagonist, Dot, as a not quite an adolescent young boy who's living with his widowed mother and deformed sister. His mother has remarried a kind of guru who calls himself the Bard. The Bard has a busted up accordion, which he refers to as the House of the Three. The House of the Three was brown and fragile, like those dead people the wind sometimes uncovered, whose flesh when touched would turn to fine dust, blowing off the browned bones. The house is the accordion itself and the three are the three chords it can play. One chord has a distinctly feminine sound called Anna. One has a distinctly masculine sound called Robra. And the final chord is a child called uh, Viljastram Aratan. I think that's how that's pronounced. And this child annoys the bard because the child doesn't have purpose per se. As the bard is introducing Dot to these chords, he's introducing how men, women and children fit into the bard's very isolating world. Anna, she's the one who wears the pants. She chops all the wood, she hoes the fields, picks the greens and cooks, and leads the animals around. We don't know how she fits all that into her days, but she does, and all the time she's humming and thrumming. Robra, he's a typical man, said the bard. He wears the comfortable robes, and he spends all his time in the tea tent talking wisdom with the bard. He's happy with very little, as everyone should be. His voice is like a heartbeat. It's so low, it's hard to hear, but it's there all the time. Bill just Ramatan, that one's a mystery child. Bill just Ramatan is not boy and he's not girl, or is boy and girl together. Very high, like a mosquito, and distracting like that, and unrestful. Bill just Ramatan is always bothering the other two to come and dance. They never do, of course, they just go about their ways and ignore him. So, Bill just Ramatan weaves song stuff around them crazy and crazier finishing every time in a giggling heap. And when that's quieted, we can hear Anna and Robra again steady in their song. Dot's father has died in an armed conflict and his mother has handed over her entire widow's inheritance to the bard to raise her children in his compound. However, Dot doesn't quite fit in. 
he is considered the one of the bard's favorites but when he turns 12 he decides to leave the community for the materialistic outside world in the outside world dot soon finds the house of the many where the house of the three was made of worn brown wood the many's seem to have grown into its curves of blood red glass trimmed with silver lines where the threes had two yellow teeth the many's bore a full set dazzling plasticky white slippery black and at the other end a grid of black buttons where the threes rooms were joined with a cracked fan of brown paper that shed dust the many's had moist looking red leather the house of the many becomes a symbol for an education dot would never have received from the bard its sounds are the new and exciting world of material wealth of all the people and the colors the food everything of the outside world so those are the two of my personal favorites in the collection i find that the first half of the book to be superior to the last half I think whoever curated this collection knew damn well the stories to get readers hooked enough to complete the whole book. I'd like to wrap up my review with a traffic light recommendation for people. A red light for those who I wouldn't recommend this novel to, yellow light for those who might want to read this novel, and a green light for anyone who would definitely enjoy black juice. Margot Lanigan writes young adult fiction and Black Juice is meant to be for the young adult reader. However, the only thing I find to be young adult about it is the age of the protagonists. Not necessarily, I, I wouldn't recommend it to young readers. Every protagonist in every story is coming of age and regardless of their actual age they're grappling with leaving their childhood or a life of dependence behind for their independent adult future even the story about the elephants i wouldn't recommend this to any kid who's a bit sensitive about their reading ability the subtle hints in the world building might go over some heads and sometimes the protagonist's names are unpronounceable I might suggest recommending it to someone who does very well in their English and willing to reread stories to get everything. I absolutely do recommend it to any adult who wants to be a writer and wants a recommendation on who to read and or try to emulate. Margot Lanigan's language would be a brilliant recommendation for writers. I absolutely do recommend Black Juice to any adult or kid who loves weird or speculative fiction or just gets a kick out of strange coming of age stories. I will love you and leave you for now but before you go please comment below if you've read any of Margot Lanigan's work and what's your favourite? If you haven't read Black Juice, I have an Australian affiliate link uh, below so you can um, order the ebook and start reading straight away. I also have links to Margot Lanigan herself, like her Twitter and to her blog. So uh, thank you and goodbye.